and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson. Uh, we are sitting here on Name, Image, and Likeness Eve. NIL Eve. We'll get into that in just a little bit, as well as uh, on CBSSports.com. We are unveiling our strength of schedule rankings. Uh, Tom Fernelli here on this podcast did the Big Ten on Monday. Uh, Barrett Salee did the SEC on Tuesday. Chip did the ACC on Wednesday. And uh, you know, Thursday, Friday, Big 12. Pac-12, you know the deal. And so with strength of schedule in mind, uh, we wanted to open that up into scheduling and bring in uh, some of Bud's expertise with the the pivotal question of, you know, does scheduling, non-conference scheduling in particular, can it help recruiting? You know, the old myth that the reason why you want to go certain places is so that you can go recruit in this age of national recruiting, in this age of social media. Is that really still the case? We're going to dig into some of that. Uh, but again, I uh, want to start with sort of the current event of the moment. We are sitting here on June 30th, and there have been two interesting developments, one a little bit more newsy, the other a bit more of a wink-wink and a nod-nod in terms of some of the top quarterbacks in all of college football, and a little bit of a preview of what we might have going into name, image, and likeness. The first of which is that Graham Mertz has filed a trademark application for his own logo. He is going to be a brand. He has a, a, a little design and uh, he is going to be the owner of that. And that means that apparel that is sold with the Graham Mertz official logo, that, that's going to be something that he can use to profit off his name, image, and likeness. We've already seen reporting about the trademark application. Uh, the other one, again, I said is a little bit more of a wink, wink and nod, nod. We've got a interesting tweet from Clemson quarterback, DJ Uyunglele. He says, thank you. I'm paraphrasing here. It's off the top of my head. Uh, he says, thank you, Delta for all your great flights. He tagged Delta. And then he did the winking emoji and said, hashtag July 1st. So uh, with these two star quarterbacks, apparently like getting their ducks in a row for July 1st, as we sit here on June 30th, I wanted to, to take a minute and just sort of pick everyone's brains to see. Uh, I think the operative, uh, the two pieces I want to get to are number one, what are your expectations? And number two, what questions do you still have uh, left to be answered as we prepare for the NIL era? I have a pitch. To, to the players. Oh, okay. Like if Graham Mertz is getting his own trademark logo, he won't be the last. He might be the first. A lot of players are going to start doing this. And, you know, like Graham Mertz is trademarking his logo to sell merchandise and all that kind of stuff with his logo. But if you're going to start a company, you need to advertise. And I'm thinking Graham Mertz or any other player with a logo, what you need to do is you need to pay the members of the Cover 3 podcast to wear your gear on the air. You see that Tampa Bay logo behind Bud right now? That could be a Graham Mertz logo. It doesn't it have to be Tampa Bay. So, you know, get in touch with Cover 3. If you're an athlete on July 1st, hit us up, slide in the DMs, get at us on Twitter, email us, whatever you got to do, and let's talk deals. Let's talk some business. You want us to wear your stuff? Let us know. We're open for business, man. I, I'm definitely all about that. I, I am interested in... Uh, and how much some of these kids will make. I, I think that the the best players, the numbers are going to surprise people that they're going to be much higher than anticipated. Also, uh, some of the female athletes who have really big Instagram followings, whether they're good or not at their sport, are going to get some really big money because the advertisers don't really care. They just care about your follower count and, and what your engagement is. And some of the engagement for some of these posts is, is pretty damn high. Um, but I also... You know, I know of a school out there and a buddy of mine is, is a booster and he owns a couple of businesses and somebody reached out and uh, like, hey, like they're open for endorsements and appearance fees and all this stuff. And the guy's like, how much? And, and they said like 1500 a month. And he's like, dude, we suck. Like I, there, there's nobody on this team who anybody recognizes. Like, like that's not that's not worth it to me. But some people, it is worth it as an advertiser or as a supporter of the school, right? You may want to throw some money at somebody who doesn't really have great market value, but what is market value anyway? It's basically what the market will pay you. Mm -hmm. And if the, I think that the schools are going to be taking, because the, the legislation is expected to be uh, approved later today, this temporary um, allowance for athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness from the NCAA, 
the my understanding is that one of the reasons that they're going with uh, more temporary language and temporary legislation is that because it's a stopgap, maybe it makes them less liable to any kind of lawsuits for the NCAA restricting athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness. And they are just kicking this can all the way down to the schools and allowing the schools saying, hey, guys, you figure this out. And so I correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not think that we will have a database for name, image, and likeness. This is going to have to be stuff that's going to be reported out. I don't think we've got a clearinghouse where schools can say, uh, you can do that, you can't do that. My understanding is that all of those issues, the NCAA has basically said, hands off. No, we're, we're not even going to worry about that. And they passed on that responsibility. It is not in the interest of any school to be restrictive here. Do you think any schools are going to be restrictive? And do you think it's going to be just totally wide open across the board? Because the NCAA in its temporary legislation seems to be allowing it, if schools are willing, for it to be totally across the board. We don't even have like a reporting or a clearinghouse or, or any kind of official database or document where we're going to be able to know. I mean, I'm okay with the wild, wild west, but do you think that that's what's going to happen here in the next you know, 24, 48 hours, one week, two week? I would say, I think we will have a little bit of wild, wild westishness early on. But if you look at some of the rules that these schools have crafted, they're really doing it to keep rigging the game in, in the favor of the schools, right? Like they're, they're putting in clauses like, hey, the compensation cannot be uh, in excess of what your market value is for the size of, of the reach. For instance, right? Let's say we at the Cover Three Podcast, you know, a, a good podcast number is, uh, you know, like like thirty five CPM, which is a, a marketing measure, right? For, for every ten thousand impressions you get, you get thirty five, you know, thirty five dollars, whatever. Uh, if somebody, the school, I think, is going to say, okay, we know that's kind of the industry standard. If we were athletes and somebody who's a booster wanted to come and pay the Cover Three Podcast two fifty CPM. Mm. then I think they that they're going to try to police that. My personal opinion here is that they shouldn't try to police this at all, and they should just get the hell out of the way and let the market decide. Um, but it's the schools, and they've they invented the term student-athlete 70 years ago now to try to keep all the money to themselves. I, I'm sure they're, they're going to try to fight like crazy to not have a lot of money flowing to the players that could be going to the schools. And also to give like listeners who might not, realize like but you mentioned like the top players are probably going to get more people more money than a lot of people might think i got an email today from like a pr company that's like the instagram rich list okay and now it's based on pe like celebrities athletes on instagram how much money they can get per post based on how much of their followers now keep in mind the names of these people are bigger but like if you look at somebody like the rock who has 247 million followers he can get a 1.5 million per post just for you know like putting on his instagram hey i love this so like if you try to extrapolate that down to like you know a dj uyunglele who has about seventy thousand followers on instagram maybe not the same exact rate but he could probably get around 750 dollars to a thousand dollars per post based off of the rates of what they're getting so even if that's not like you know life-changing money that's still if you can get 750 bucks just for saying hey i like to drink this color gatorade that's pretty good for a college kid. And if you do that repeatedly and you get a bunch of different companies doing it, there's some actual money that some of these kids are going to be able to make. So what's the, what, what is the sense that um, the schools, is there any uniform is, is the, the average sort of, you know, school rules are being set up in a way where most of them are setting these like reasonable standards for, um, for, for the amount of money that you can get, how much involvement do, is there, across the board and is it kind of standard like is is that the one thing where all these schools are talking to each other about hey are you doing this we're going to do this like is somebody going to go renegade here and just you know basically write in the rules to say what whatever you want uh you can go do like the ncaa has that rule about drug testing where it says we are not going to enforce a, a certain drug testing policy we only require you to follow your own policy. So some of these schools, their own policy is very, very lenient. So they can say, hey, man, we're following our own policy. I, is, is it going to be maybe a little bit closer to that? 
Well, okay. There's an argument here to be made that the schools in states who did not pass a law are actually in a better spot than the schools in states who did pass a law. Right. Now, I on agree. the one on the one hand, I think some schools would push back and say, "No, we, we we'd really like some guidance from our state, as opposed to having to just come up with, with our our policy out of thin air." Because at least if we come up with a policy that at the NCAA later comes back and says, which I don't think they'll do, by the way, but if they later come back and say, "Hey, this was not legal." Uh, this is pretty clearly an, an effort to skirt the uh, the you know, pay for play type stuff. You could at least say, "Look, pff, it's our state law. T- take it up with Florida, right? T- take it up with Georgia, or wherever." Uh, but I'm sure somebody will. Like, there's going to be very interesting interpretations of what is allowable. There are schools, and coaches will tell you this. They bounce around school to school. Some of these compliance departments are real strict, and some of them are not. Right. And I think we're going to see some variance. I, I'm not thinking that there's going to be a national standard that every single team out there follows. Maybe I'm wrong. Do you think oh. that he, oh, go ahead. One other thing. Uh, we were in a brainstorming meeting for, for 24 seven a couple weeks ago. And uh, Chris Hummer told me that he thinks there will actually be a database at some point of athletes and their endorsements. Now the thing is a, will it be public or is it just available to the NCAA for compliance purposes? And B, will it be updated contemporaneously or is it just sort of like after the season the numbers get released those i don't know so and when do you think the dj Uyunglele is about to unveil a delta sponsorship i mean that's killer right i mean that is the one of the top most recognizable quarterbacks in all of college football one of the top most recognizable players in all of college football if someone's going nationwide and of course delta based in atlanta like a good like regional matchup a lot of delta flights or how fans in the southeast get from place to place like what when you say some of the numbers that would surprise you i mean this is this is when we're sort of trailing a little bit too far off the rails from where i wanted to go what <laughs> what, what what does that look like like what kind of uh what kind of money is there for dj Uyunglele? because my initial guess bud was the opposite i was thinking the, the numbers associated to the deals might surprise people because they are too low, but the numbers of athletes who are going to cash in is going to surprise people for what you said earlier, which is you're not thinking as a college football fan about how much money some of these other athletes and other sports have just because of their own Instagram following and just because of their own popularity on social media, just because they're not on ESPN or on CBS sports or on the you know, sports center doesn't mean that they are not uh, having value out in the marketplace. I, I, like I said earlier, I think that based on his followers and based on the rate I saw in that, the, the release I got earlier today, I think he could get about $750 a post maybe. But I also think that like DJ Uyunglele, I don't know if he's a big enough name right now to really command Delta. Like maybe as the season goes on, if he's in the high, I mean, is he shooting his shot? Like, yeah, I think he's just shooting his shot right now. But I'm saying as the season goes on and like if Clemson's competing for a national title and he's in the Heisman race, I think that's when he'll be able to more, you know, strongly capitalize on his name and his image and his likeness. So I, I don't know how much anybody can get right now because like it's like last year, if this had happened at this time last year when you had Trevor Lawrence, who was going to be the clear number one pick in the NFL draft, and there was the clear cut superstar in college football. I think he was in a better position to take the, take advantage of this last year than I don't I, I don't know who the player is right now. That is somebody that is the alpha kind of number one college football player in the country that everybody would recognize or at least most of the country would recognize to command that kind of money to help push that kind of product. Cause that's the other thing too. Like, honestly, I, I I'm going through this email and looking at these numbers and bud kind of like what you were talking about to a person I was like, are you kidding? We're not worth that. But I, I got, I have some questions for people in marketing departments of some, certain brands and companies. It's like, I don't think you're really getting the return on your investment that you're paying for here. You know, podcasts are a great return on investment. If you guys want to sure. advertise on the cover of your podcast, bud.elliot, that's two L's, two T's at cbsi.com. We'll make it happen. Um, I, Tom, I agree with you, by the way. I think that, look, these PR agencies that send this kind of stuff out are, they're interested in the shock value. I don't fully trust a lot of those numbers that they send out personally. For instance, I looked up on, was it Webfluential? How much each of my tweets are worth. And I'm a verified account. I have, what does Bud Elliot have? Like, 
a pretty high score as far as not fake followers, you know, um, 63,000. They estimate that my tweets are worth between 180 and $245 each. There ain't no way. <laughs> right now. I'm not saying that like they're worth zero and I have promoted stuff on social before, but I can tell you that ain't the rate. So I think for some of these dudes, Oh, I can make this per tweet. Yeah. If you can find somebody to pay you that, but, but good luck. It, it, it's, there's this sort of fallacy that, okay, if I tweet this many times and I have this rate, first of all, the more, the more you post, the, the less likely that you are to, you know, have each individual post emphasized. So that decreases the value some. And you also need to actually have a recognizable name, I believe, or at least a recognizable following. Um, for instance, Evan Stewart, right, is a five-star receiver out of Texas. He has over 2 million TikTok followers right now. Now, the average person out there doesn't know who Evan Stewart is, but if you are trying to reach people in sort of that 16 to like 24 demographic, you don't care if somebody who's 40 knows who Evan Stewart is. You know he's got a lot of TikTok followers. So I still think there's – these guys are – some of these guys are going to make a whole lot of money, but I think it will actually kind of reflect the curve of – my opinion is always like, look, college is a pretty damn good deal for about like 85 90% of the roster. It's a real crappy deal for about the top 10% of players out there. And this is where I think you're going to see like those top 10% of players where college and the scholarship is probably not reflective of their market value as far as compensation from university. I think those are the people who will get most of the dollars in this. What are some of your questions that are still left to be answered? Um, your curiosities, you know, the things that um, you're not sure about as we prepare to enter the NIL era. Well, uh, couple things number one i think a lot of these kids are going to get sued because they're not going to perform on their contracts um, they're going to be unprofessional with it they're not going to do a great job especially if they haven't retained you know an actual firm that can help them with this kind of stuff a lot of these kids also just routinely rip photos of them and use them well if you're using that for one thing on twitter you know or, or your instagram page you you may get a dmca takedown notice you may get sued if you start to use that stuff for commercial purposes without compensating the photographer, there's a lot of these photogs out there that rightfully, because it takes time and effort to, you know, to, to do it are basically copyright trolls, right? And, and they will take, and, and they'll, they'll sue you for, for using their, your photo or their photo in your promotional material, right? Like you're using it for commercial purpose, not art or anything else like, like that, which you know could be fair use. So I think there's going to be a lot of, um, interesting ways to go. And if these guys don't do a good job with it, they could hurt the market in the future because businesses will be turned off. Hey, I, I paid this guy, you know, he filled the contract technically, but he didn't really put a lot of effort into it, that, that type of stuff. But I think some guys who do a really good job will have great re repeat business. What do you think, Tom? What are your questions? I think Bud covered a lot. I just, uh, I, I don't really have any more to add to it. It's going to be interesting to see. I think we're going to get questions out of it. I think that part of it's just going to be, like Bud said, the thing that it's not like you can just get the endorsement and go tweet something or post something on Instagram. Like the companies are going to have a certain expectation for you. And a lot of these kids, you know, for the most part, they're not paid advertisers. They don't understand. Like Bud's saying, there's going to be some issues that they run into with the fair use and that kind of stuff. So, it's strange to me because I feel like a lot of these kids are going to have an opportunity to make money. But the thing is, once you start making money, then you have to spend it. So now all of a sudden they're, they're going to need lawyers. They're going to need firms to make sure that they're not tripping up or slipping up or doing anything wrong. So it's, it's going to be a, a interesting situation, which like Bud said, I think there's going to be a small percentage of players that truly do make money off of this. And I think just about everybody else really isn't going to get a whole lot out of the deal, or at least it won't be worth the effort or trouble for them. So a lot of the schools, by the way, are pitching these kids, hey, we have in-house photogs, we have in-house graphic designers, we will help you with this. So I don't want to make it seem like they're going to trip up on this at every turn, but I'm sure somebody will slip up, try to do their own. Do the schools get a cut if they're providing this stuff, or is it just they're going to use this just for promotional? Because I haven't heard of these schools be getting cut. See. But like if, if, some, if somebody lands a crazy deal, or for instance, let's say, uh, I'm trying to think here. I'm just thinking of negative recruiting now where a coach is in somebody's living room like, hey, this school is going to take 3% of your earnings. We're only taking two and a half. Yeah, that's yes. why I don't think I don't think they will. The, the, the cut they'll take is basically 
one school can afford to do it for you and the other school doesn't have yeah. a, enough in-house photogs. Here's a hypothetical. What if JT Daniels, um, who plays for a Nike school, what if he wants to get an Adidas sponsorship? I think Is that the on school his school going to stop him. I think on his social media channels, he would be allowed to be an Adidas rep, but I don't think he would be allowed to display the Georgia logo alongside Adidas. And that would be what they would advise him. I agree. That, yeah, that, because I also feel like would that have a bigger impact? That'll have a bigger impact with basketball, I think, than football, because I think that like those, the shoe deals in basketball are clearly a much bigger deal, especially with recruiting. And as we've seen with FBI investigations in recent years, they've played a large role in the way that recruits and where recruits end up going to school. So I've, I've been doing a little bit of keeping an eye on how schools are staffing up and trying to establish new departments like branding departments and try to figure out how they can uh, advertise themselves as, not only to their current players, but also to recruits to say, exactly like what you mentioned. Hey, if you, if you commit here, you know, check it out. We've got uh, this whole team that's going to be able to help you craft exactly what you want to do. I think that I would like to know that it's not just, you know, hiring photographers, hiring graphic designers, but also being able to provide some of the, um, the guidance that might allow athletes to not get sued. That is my biggest question. And that is my biggest concern is what are the school's going to do to be able to help. And they're not going to be incentivized necessarily to help a lot. I mean, you don't want your player to be sued, but if you're not getting a cut and you're running low on resources and you're thin, and if if it's between working on this little side project for JT Daniels or putting together the highlight hype film that needs to be tweeted out on Thursday at at 9 a.m., I'm I'm very interested to see how all of a sudden this big load of work is going to end up getting split up between athletic departments that are already on a little bit of a resource crunch. Here's another question for you. Like if schools are setting up all these branding stuff to, you know, educate the players, do you get course credit? If you're um, going to like a branding course, yes. you're going to get credit for that? Yeah. Like we, we saw Florida State already has, I think, three courses that you'll get course credit for. So that's like, and which for Florida State, it's like going to see a whole lot of marketing majors the in the students. future here. I they mean, all, they already have a big marketing and uh, advertising school. So for the communications department. Uh, yeah. So basically, the old like hire an intern to be able to get stuff done because it's free work and it's exchanged for course credit. Now all of a sudden, that just becomes the answer to my question about the resources. It's like, how do we? Oh. <laughs> no, Chip, I misunderstood. I thought you meant do the athletes get course credit for learning about marketing? Because at Florida State, they do. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Respect. I feel like if you're making them go to classes now and then on top of other classes, you should probably be giving them credit for it. Now, I was thinking about the like within the athletic department and the graphic design department, the people that are paid now, all of a sudden, hopefully all have a team of interns that are students and getting course credit because then. I mean, listen, it's college we've, athletics. They find ways to get free labor anywhere you can get it. We've started That's a whole a, new course like credit economy here. Yes. <laughs> so I've, I've got one for you. And, and I, I think NIL is actually really good. I think despite the potential pitfalls of this, yeah, they're going to pay taxes. Guess what? Cool. Pay some taxes. G- glad you guys are making money. Might have to have a lawyer. Awesome. Who hasn't had, had to have a lawyer at some point in their life? Do you think fans care about this? No, to, like apps. Yeah. Like I got to tell you, I've seen the numbers on this as far as like Google analytics and what our traffic looks like. I think it's going to be a curiosity initially. I think mm-hmm. they really will care about it to the extent that it helps them in recruiting, but man, like do NBA fans, I don't watch NBA much except for the playoffs. Do they care when like the 20th or 40th best player in the NBA gets a new shoe deal? No, no. like they don't care. Right. Like, this is a thing we're going to Unless talk about. Unless the shoes are stupid looking, and then they will get roasted. Right. Hilarious commercials, really cool, done, like well done commercials, uh, funky products that you would not expect a kid to endorse, anything like that. You know, like like Steve Spurrier selling, you know, fertilizer or, you know, Bear Bryant selling potato chips, something like that. Like some iconic, you know, potentially funny ones that are awkward. Like that we'll talk about. I just don't think, or huge round numbers. Like it was a big deal when the first coach got a million dollar contract, right? It'll probably be a pretty big deal when the first NIL kid gets a hundred G's, you know? Yeah. It's like, I feel like NIL is another one of those topics where 
the college football and college sports media is far more interested in it than the actual college sports fan. To me, it's like NCAA violations. Like, I feel like there's a bunch of media outlets that really, really it's water carriers for the about, NCAA. Yeah, that really, yeah. really care about NCAA violations. Where the average fan is like, I, I don't care. I'm just want to watch the game and know if my team's gonna win. It's well, weird when caring about journalism butts up against caring about the athletes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, all right. I'll put it. Um, we can sort of bring it home on this. I was told by all the water carriers and by everybody trying to preserve the old system that there would be all these unintended consequences and that it would be the end of college sports as we knew it. And as we sit here on June 30th, it doesn't seem like people are panicking. It kind of seems like we're just all moving forward. So anything that was drawn up was boogeyman, straw man, whatever you want to call it. And whatever unintended consequences there are, I, my argument against it was like, well, fine, let's see what they are. And then we'll address it. And then we'll adapt. And then we'll try to continue to create an environment that can work for as many people as possible who are investing their own time um, and effort into creating college sports and, and all the revenue that is generated around it. Like, I, I don't hear people kicking and screaming, being like, this is going to be terrible. But that's what they told us a year ago. You know, that's what they told us six months ago. They told us that this is going to be awful for college sports. And they are um, interestingly silent as they as we approach the deadline right here on July 1st with, uh, I believe, 11 or 12 states um, passing NIL laws that will take effect here either on July 1st or later this month. Oh, Chip, you forgot the, uh, the, the, the one they kept throwing at us, uh, which was um, – there's going to be so much resentment when the quarterback in the locker room is making a hundred thousand and this, this guy's only making 50 bucks. Like, well, you know what? Do you think there's more resentment there or more resentment when a head coach makes 7 million and you make $0? Like yes. some of these guys think these assistant coaches are, are morons. Right. <laughs> and some of them honestly are there just because they're good at recruiting. And like, when it comes to ask time to coach, like, you know, like I, I knew of a guy who the players went to went to the head coach and said, hey, can you please take this assistant off special teams? Like the guy literally just does not know what he's doing. And they did. Like, do you think they resent that guy more for making 650 or the, or the quarterback who's getting a couple extra thousand? I mean, this, this will a, divide this is a, this is a locker man. rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, do you think MB, like MLB players, does the guy making the league minimum just got caught up from AAA as an injury replacement? Does he resent Mike Trout for making yes. 40? But does it screw up the locker room? No. no. Like, keep your resentment to yourself. Guess what? Like, if you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Be, be happy you're like on Trout. the team. Be yeah. like Trout. You'll get the money. Right. They just there's all, there's all these little like fake arguments that if you take half a second or if you have more than 240 characters, you can just destroy. And you know what? Like, to be to be fair, like the the player that will care is a player that was already going to be pissed about something else anyway. Sure. Yeah. I was thinking the, there's already it's not an equitable locker room. Yeah. Even if we're just talking about social capital, right? <laughs> just who? I mean, eighteen to twenty-two year olds like you care a lot about social capital, and, and quarterbacks got more than you do. Sorry, bro. <laughs> just you're just a dumb offensive lineman. Go hit something. Hey, those dumb offensive linemen can really come in handy we're when things get wild else. out no, there we, in the bar. <laughs> offensive linemen are the smartest players on the team. That's let's, true. Let's be real; they have to know every single play. That's true. Coming up on the other side, starting to take a look at non-conference scheduling and whether the old uh, belief that being able to build your non-conference schedule around recruiting, whether that is, is still holding up in the modern recruiting era, getting into that and more next. So I thought this one, this one's from the ideas tab. And I thought that this one was a, a fun one to dig into because we've seen not only recruiting change, so much over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, but the pandemic upended the entire system for schools to get really creative and uh, try and come up with new ways to make contact with prospects. And so the, let's, let's start with the sort of trying to answer the question, but I'm gonna pitch it to you first. Do you think that when schools, especially um, when schools are making their non-conference schedules, do you think they still have recruiting in mind and then, I guess maybe the second part of that that we can work to is, you know, are all schools, you know, if, if some schools don't worry about it anymore, do some schools still worry about it because of the kind of players that they're trying to get or the kind of areas they're trying to get to? 
how do you see that relationship between recruiting and non-conference schedules uh, here in 2021? So Chip, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think ultimately uh, it matters a little bit less for recruiting purposes that, than it used to matter. Uh, and that is primarily because there are more outlets for everybody to be watched on TV on a weekly basis, right? Um, with basically any cable package, whether it's you know, Spectrum or Comcast or YouTube TV or whatever, more teams are playing nationally more. Back before the 1984 decision, uh, when you only had a couple televised games, if your son or daughter was considering playing out of state, you would have to basically go travel to see them home or road. Uh, now, like, or, or you know, if they had a road game that was back around where you actually came from, that was a big deal. It was an additional chance for your parent to see you. I will tell you something, that still matters. Most, most teams out there do not recruit nationally, right? Most teams recruit locally and regionally. Like your Bamas and Ohio States are not normal. Otherwise, you'd see a lot of other really rich programs killing it with no local local talent around them, you know. Um, so it is still a big deal. I think it is honestly part of why Notre Dame uh, won't join the ACC. Yeah. Correct, because they still want to play a game in San Antonio. They still want to play g games out in California. Um, you know, like they want to maintain that national presence. In addition to the fact they just absolutely killed it with this new playoff deal. Like they, everybody's like, you're going to join the ACC. I'm like, nah, man, they, they really did a great job with this deal for themselves. But it's not as big of a deal as it used to be, I don't think, because you can see your son play more often, at least. Um, and the world is smaller, I think, with with Zoom and, and digital technology and communication. But it, it's not it's not nothing. It's great to be able to say, hey, look, we're playing road games an hour away from you twice in the next three years. Like that's an additional chance for you to see your son. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, I, I think it still plays a role, like Bud says. I don't think it plays as much of a role because, like Bud said, with television and all that stuff. But going back to the Notre Dame thing with anybody, if if you're a Midwest team and you're recruiting a California kid, like having a game scheduled out on the West Coast is going to be attractive. It's not going to be a deciding factor for any player, but it is something that I think impacts it. But I do think that as time goes on and the technology continues to evolve and the playoff becomes a bigger deal – I think that most programs and schools aren't going to be looking at it as much of, well, you know, we need to do this to help get these, you know, make recruits happy as a recruiting pitch. It's going to be, we just need to play these games to help ensure our ability to get the playoff and then get that money. Do coaches when they are playing road games uh, and it's the, you know, depending on when it falls in the recruiting calendar, are, are coaches going to see games in this other territory on Fridays trying to go make contact with players or show up at their games or um, you know, watch somebody either through an evaluation or like a sign of interest? I think, I mean, first of all, like if they're, if they're going to go watch somebody, they're going to do it anyway, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not they actually are, are playing the game there, but it doesn't hurt to time that up with that. You know, um, that's what I was thinking is like, if you are, if you've got a game, scheduled against a team from Florida, a team from Texas, a team from California, and it's a non-conference game that you are also building into that, the idea that either a head coach or a staff member or a couple of coaches are also trying to use that as a, a chance to go out there and whoever your top prospect is or whatever team or whatever like high school coach you have a relationship with, you know, I, I actually, that was the first thing I thought of. And maybe that's not, maybe it is more about the pitch to the parents and being able to see your son than it is the actual recruiting efforts. Is that what it sounds right? I, I think so. Yeah. But ultimately that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. I just had this, I, it was almost like the satellite camp line of thinking where I thought that you would be planning your non-conference schedule to get you and your staff in places of the country where your conference is not and that gives you the opportunity to, to make contact with the recruits, to go see games on Friday, invite them to be able to come and you know, see you as the visiting team at this other stadium. The, uh, the aspect of, of trying to, to sell it for the future, I honestly hadn't even thought of until we started to really dig into it. It, it doesn't hurt, certainly, Chip. I, I, I think the main thing is, hey, like, here's an opportunity for, for your family. I mean, travel is expensive. A, a, a lot of these kids come from, you know, kind of the lower end on the, the you know, economic background and it's difficult to travel, especially air travel. 
Um, so having a game that you can drive to or two games you can drive to reasonably, especially if you don't have to have hotel costs, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, we saw Urban Meyer you know, voice this as well back in the day when, when playing all these playoff games, saying, hey, like, it's great, but our, our, the parents of our players can't afford to go see them play. So can we, can we get some, some you know, parent travel costs covered here? I think a lot of that factors into this. Oh, By the way, DJU, oh, okay. uh, $125 to $150 per tweet, according to uh, Webfluential. So you are more influential. On Twitter. On Twitter. Not on Instagram, I don't think, though. No. Uh-huh. Then DJ Uyunglele. Bud L.A. All right, so uh, episode title. Unless I typed in the wrong one. Bud uh, L.A. How many, how many, does he have 38,000 on, on, on uh, Twitter, I assume? <sighs> But Elliot yeah, he does. more yeah. Twitter popular than DJ Uyunga mm-hmm. Lele. But he's got like 70,000 on Instagram. So And Instagram is more valuable by far than Twitter. Yep, because pictures sell better than words. They do. But that's speaking of DJU though, like talking about paying for, you know, pay, players to come or families come see their their kids. Go to Clemson. If DJU's got a Delta sponsorship, maybe he can get them some airfare, some free tickets. No doubt. Um, or like, what if you want to move your family to the school you're going to play with? What if you get a marketing deal? Uh, real estate company. <laughs> real estate company. Maybe you're endorsing an apartment complex. Maybe the way you get paid is by having a couple extra apartments, maybe a couple suites or something like that. Well, the, the top players, that can already be arranged. Chip, what are you talking Chip, about? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> For the Come very on. top players, there's a few rental houses or apartments or condos around town that can be accessed if needed you know i mean I've, hell like some schools will just create some schools will just create a whole church for you for, for your dad to come preach at some schools so i've heard <laughs> allegedly 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 that will that could be the case so that was my uh that was my final question it was a little bit more you hinted at it with the alabama the ohio state uh clemson dj uyunglele coming from california uh, all the way to south carolina but with non-conference scheduling in mind I felt like it doesn't even really matter for the top dogs and that it might still matter a little bit more for some of those mid tier power five teams. Is that correct? I agree. Yeah, Yeah. no doubt. Yeah. Because you're already, you've already got an infrastructure in place from Alabama to be Bryce young, like our, our starting quarterbacks from for Alabama and Clemson are both from California. Different world. Where's CJ Stroud from? California. California? Mm-hmm. Mm. USC needs a new coach. Rancho Cucamonga, Cuc- I believe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Poor Clay uh, Helton. One, this uh, is why, by the way, I jumped USC with that first pick for the draft. The, the If everybody – or was it mailbag, I think we had? It was a good segment. Yeah. It was, a, it was the mailbag. If everybody was at their peak efficiency all at the same time, who ends up winning the national championship? A lot of quarterbacks out there. Mm-hmm. A uh, lot of parents who can afford to send their kids to quarterback coaches since the time they're five, too. Oh, mm-hmm. God, some of these guys. Ugh. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, Elite 11 starts this week. Be sure to follow 24-7 Sports. Steve Wiltfong, Alan True, Brandon Huffman, Blair and Gulo, all out there doing a great job from the Elite 11 camp. You know, I, some of the stuff I don't really get a lot out of as media, but some of the stuff it's good to see guys – throw side by side you get to see some inefficiencies in the stroke you get to see how the ball comes out of their hand you get to see you know how, like the flight some of the footwork stuff it's it's useful i mean i think there are some some times where you can really see who's going to be a dude and then who uh maybe doesn't measure measure up quite as well you know you have uh previously mentioned quinn Ewers. you are very very high on you even wanted to pick him for your room in the quarterback draft to try and build out for the future but when you and he's committed to ohio state when you look at uh, some of the other quarterbacks that are going to be there, uh, Walker Howard, an LSU commit, Ty Simpson commit to Alabama. We talked about Simpson here uh, after his commitment. Uh, you, Connor Wegman, Cade, Klu- Klu- Cade Klubnik, who's committed to uh, Clemson, A.J. Duffy, who's committed to Florida State, Malik Murphy. Who stands out as someone that you are interested to get the feedback on from that, uh, that in-person analysis? So uh, obviously, like it's always good to see yours, just like it was always good to see Trevor, just to confirm like he's still the dude. We, we have him as the number one player in the country, regardless of, of position. Um, I've recently seen Walker Howard and A.J. Duffy. 
So like those got we had, I think, six guys at the Elite 11, and those two were the two uh, who stood out to me the most. Uh, Howard is committed to LSU. Duffy is from Cali, uh, but uh, transferred to IMG to play in Bradenton. He's committed uh, to FSU. I, I want to see how Malik Murphy does out there, the, the Texas commit. That was something interesting. If you recall, when Steve Sarkeesian got to Texas, the discussion was, is he going to go after Quinn Ewers? Is he going to be able to make that pitch? And ultimately, he decided pretty early on in the process to not mess with that and to go with Malik Murphy out of California, place place for Sarah High, obviously a big-time powerhouse. And there's a couple other guys on this list who I'm, I'm interested to see how, how they do. Um, Ja'Curry Brown, I've seen have really good performances and then some ones that are kind of lacking. He, he's committed to Miami, so I want to see how his consistency is at an event that won't emphasize his legs quite as much. Um, I want to see how Holden Gariner moves, the, the Auburn commit. I think he's got a rocket for an arm, but you know, the legs and, and the mobility is a, a little bit of a question there. Not, not a huge one, but I'll, I'll be interested to see you know, how that looks. Uh, Elite 11 guys have been hyping up Luther Richardson a whole lot. Um, not buying as of yet, not to get on a high school kid, but I'm just, uh, I don't see it. So we'll, we'll see uh, on that one. They usually have a, like a no star kid that they fall in love with. And sometimes they end up being right. And sometimes we end up being right. Yeah. And so, he's one of two kids that aren't committed anywhere yet. Uh, yeah. Who's the other one who's on Tevin Carter out of Memphis. Okay. Gotcha. And then also uh, Gavin Wimsat is a guy who rankings wise, we took a shot on uh, which, Hey, we do these really early rankings. We know they're volatile. Some are going to be real bad in the end. Some are going to be pretty damn good. Wimsat's committed to Rutgers. We thought he was going to blow up quite a bit. And uh, I don't know that he's been quite on that arc. So I want to see you know, wh where should he be rated? Make sure you follow 24 seven sports, Steve Wiltfong and the rest of the team that will be uh, out there for the elite 11 finals in Los Angeles. Uh, the action starts today. We'll run through July 3rd, uh, 24 seven sports as always your spot for all of the latest uh, on college sports and college sports recruiting. You can follow him on Twitter at Bud Elliott three. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow me at chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We're willing to wear your stuff for money. For sure.